Since I'll be working with sound, I invite you all to start by listening to the sounds that are here now. And though in this big tent, we're a bit sheltered from it, if you step outside of the tent and be quiet, you'll hear them. And I'm going to try <laughs> I'm going to try my best to harmonize with that, even though eventually I may drown it out from my own perspective here. Shoving a piece of stick into my four track to try to keep it to work. Sorry. I begin with a question. Which came first? The mushroom? Or the spore? I've never heard that answer before. The cell. A basic unit of life. So tonight we'll start there. Shrink yourself down. From the roughly one to two meters that you stand tall. To maybe five or seven or nine microns. A micron is a millionth of a meter. So however many meters you are divided by a millionth of nine, I don't know the math. You, you can just imagine. Make yourself really, really, really small. Actually, make yourself long and skinny, but maybe only three millionths of a meter wide. 
it could be long still. Maybe not two meters long. Bring yourself into the world of a hypha, a single thread-like cell of mycelium. You don't have eyes, so you could close them if you want to. But you can still sense light. You don't have ears. So you can ignore what I'm saying. But you still feel vibration. You don't have a nose. But you do sense the chemicals in the space around you. Likewise, no tongue. So you cannot speak. nor can you taste. But you can still sense the chemistry that you're touching. You know exactly where up and the down are. But you are always growing outward You're growing outward, and you are branching. You're becoming a multiplicity of yourself, of yourselves. You're sensing as you go, as you move by extension, not leaving where you have been, but always going beyond. What do you sense? Do you smell food? Warmth? Do you feel warm? Do you feel attraction? To another? Around you? Near or far? How do you sense them? How do you tell them you're there? You have no vocal cords. You cannot speak. No lips, no teeth, no tongue. No soft or hard palate. Chemistry. Extracellular metabolites. Pheromones. These are what you surround yourself with. Digestive enzymes. You no longer ingest and digest. You simply outgest.
you're blessed by the nutrients, the nourishment surrounding you, becoming you. that with which you build yourself. Now back to the attraction. The blessings of your surroundings becoming you help you to go forward, to go outward, up, down, all around. To myceliate. And so, you send your signals you receive signals. Little molecules of communication, chemical poetry, if there is such a thing. grow towards those words you love the most, those that suit you, those to which you are suited. Until you meet another, And then the other ceases to be. It doesn't disappear. The relationship dissolves and becomes unified. Hyphy merge, fuse, walls dissolve. Cell walls dissolve. The water within the cells, that which is flowing through and connecting, communicating through you. Does so through this new part of you as you send the core of yourself, your cellular nuclei, through giving nuclei, and at the same time, you receive these gifts from that new part of you. Until each cell, each segment of the continuum that is your mycelium, the walls between the cells are porous and fluid. each cell has a relation of that core of self that originated within you and the core of self that originated in that new part of you. This 
is now what a mycologist might call the dicaryotic state. Kind of like two brains in one body. Kind of. You still surround yourself with enzymes. With many fluids washing over you. Those to transform your surroundings into nutrients you can absorb, those to protect yourself, those to transform your surroundings into a hospitable place for yourself, a more hospitable place. And you continue to be blessed, to be nourished, to be nurtured. By that which surrounds you. Until the season is right. Until it is moist until you are satiated you draw your energy in focused in a tight knot a tight Tight knot. Prepared. Preparing. For an expansion. Into the open air. Preparing for fulfillment. A deeper level of unification. This hyphal knot begins to differentiate. You begin to form tissues when you had none before. You only had cells. You moved in the ways of the moment, of the place, without preconception or planning, without design, simply by pattern, by sensing, by being present and improvising. But now a shift is occurring, a transition building to growing a part of yourself that is so deeply embedded in, in who you are. A form 
recognizable. Order emerging from chaos. And this primordium, the baby mushroom that you have created, waits in humid air at the interface between solid and gas, both filled with liquid. And then you give yourself, from all of yourself, to that part of yourself. And that part of yourself reaches to the air, pushes away pushes away from the solid into the gas. Breathing deeply, drinking deeply, opening, lengthening, spreading, and there are revealed your tenderest parts. Organized. For so much surface area. So much potential. So many tiny sites. of relation, of recombination, of regeneration. And it is there on the fertile undersurface Eiffel tips, which are many, many, swell, and that core of yourself, the nucleus of yourself, and that other core of yourself that once was not part of yourself, the two that have been dancing together in cells and cells and cells since you met and merged finally touch and not only do they touch but they merge you merge with yourself the part of yourself that once was not part of yourself partner and many new possibilities arise sweet, sweet water from within yourself, forming a protective coat,
sometimes when a mushroom is releasing many spores, if you hold them up to a light like this, you can see them. Dusts of microscopic particles, clouds like smoke, wafting up and curling. This one may be too dry. those new bundles of potential the next generation the spores can't stay they must disperse and so Each of those little parts of you, each of those developing spores, pushes out sweet liquid, sweet liquid, in two places, at the base and on the side. On its narrow perch, atop the basidium two droplets of nectar grow and grow swelling round and soft until they touch and as before when the two touch they merge and then something really crazy happens the spore goes flying really, 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 really fast. So I, I don't know if you can even brace yourself, if you can even imagine, like I've been trying to get you to imagine, how fast this really is. a very long fall, but I was accelerating as I fell at the rate of 1G. It's a unit that we experience here on Earth. The acceleration of the force of gravity. When one thing falls. Now, when those spores leave the basidia to drop between the gills. It's not a G. It's about 25,000 Gs. It's the fastest thing we know about. It's the fastest acceleration humans can conceive, at least that I can at least that scientists have measured and named. Huh. So I don't know if you can even try to imagine how it would feel to go from complete stillness to flying so fast. But you don't have to try too hard because it doesn't last long. In a millionth of a second after you've been ejected forcibly by a simple shift of balance from two water drops becoming one and you're so light. You're this new part of yourself that is yourself this spore weighs about, I don't know, very, very little. And and it becomes 
slowed by the drag of the wind very, very soon. Your, your surface to mass ratio is in such a way that you basically stop shooting right away and you just fall. You drift. You float down between the gill into the open space between. And after what feels like a very long time, you're out from between the gills. And the wind, a breath, blows, lifts you, swirling, carried away. And at that point, it is not up to you where you will land. You're at the mercy of the wind, of the rain. And if it's meant to be, if you get really lucky, you might land somewhere nice to grow with food. Water, air, warmth. And maybe you won't be eaten. Maybe you won't be destroyed by radiation from the sun. Maybe you won't fly so high that you burn up at the edge of the atmosphere. Maybe. But let's just, for the sake of this exercise, let's just pretend, let's just suppose tonight we all get lucky. And we find a place. We are found in a place where we can poke our little germ tube out from our spore into that which surrounds us. Give our enzymes and let ourselves be nurtured, be blessed by nourishment and watered. And the cycle goes on and on, spiraling forward exponentially. On and on and on. So, while that is the basic life history of many mushrooms, I may say most mushrooms, there is great diversity. There are many ways. There are mushrooms who don't put their spores in the air. There are mushrooms that engage other forms of life. 
the ecosexual fungi, if you will. Mycologists know them as the gasteroid fungi. Gaster, meaning stomach, because they produce their spores in their stomachs. In their stomachs. Does anything sound funny about that? Fungi don't even have stomachs. They out Jeff, remember? Do you know anybody who makes their reproductive cells, their gametes, in their stomach? Do you? I, I was probably a man that came up with this term gastroid. If it were a woman, maybe, she would have called these fungi the uteroid fungi. There's a lot more similarity. And so, who here has ever... Now be honest, who here has ever stomped on a puffball or thrown one at somebody? Yeah? Oh, that's a lot of you. Okay. Who has thought about it and wanted to, but was too afraid to ask? Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> Who doesn't know what a puffball is? It's okay. I'm just closing my eyes. You can raise your hand now. A puffball is a beautiful example of a uteroid mushroom. Within a membrane are produced many spores. And as they ripen, They dry to hydrophobic dust. And like the uterus, there is an opening which forms. Similar, uh, interestingly, the term for this opening on a puff ball is called an osteol, while the small hole that becomes quite large during birth, the small hole in the cervix is called the os. And it is this portal through which life is given. And so, Puffballs aren't quite like uteruses. They lack muscle. They are passive. They rely on the rain to drip drops. Pit, pat, pit, pat. To puff little clouds of spores to the air. Or a human child coming to play, or a childish human coming to play. I hope you know that when you stomped that puffball, if it was ripe, and only if it was ripe, you were helping them.
Now, what about other uteroid fungi? What about uteroid fungi? raindrops in a different way. I'm thinking about the bird's nest fungi, the splash cups, as they're sometimes called. These are perfect from a mathematical perspective. Fungi are very good at geometry. Little parabolas in three dimensions with disks rounded like a lens filled with spores. Nutrients. And when a raindrop comes to splash, right in the sweet spot in the middle, peridials, those little spore packets, fly surprisingly far. And they stick. They stick to sticks. They stick to stucks. They stick to stuff. And that's sometimes the end of the story. They start growing, and within each packet is all the compatible spores needed to create the next generation. But sometimes it's not the end of that part of the story. These little peridials, these little lentils, of fungus. They are delicious. If you are certain types of bird or bug or small mammal. And if you are one of those types of birds or bugs or mammals that likes to eat peridial then you too are helping to spread these fungi. Just like us humans, when we use a dry toilet, if we eat berries, we are planting them. We are helping them. We are doing their bidding. We are giving them mobility. Bird's nest fungi are not the only uteroid mushrooms that are helped by animals for spore dispersal. ever smell the truffle? Anybody? Ah. Speak. Speak about it. Don't just say yeah. Mm. Yeah. Oh. Okay. There are, there are certain lucky humans with synesthesia, people who can smell colors, for example.
Nothing is missing in a truffle, especially if you're a squirrel or a red-backed bull. It's just that the best. It's the best. Even pigs, even humans, we can get into it. The famous, the ones that most of us will never really get to eat unless we work in fine dining or um, have a very, very intelligent dog companion or are wealthy. Um, these famous truffles, these produce a sex pheromone analogous to that in boars. That's why the sows were, have been engaged as hunters, diggers of these mushrooms. But an 800 pound pig is not easy to uh, convince to not eat that truffle. So they started training dogs. Good sniffers too, but they just want some love and a little meat snack in return for their amazing find. And so, but really the best is if you're a squirrel, because you're not limited those famous truffles of humanity. So many different truffles are alluring, appealing, desirable, delicious, and indeed sexy. Uh, to be a squirrel, to be a northern flying squirrel. To swoop down in the safety of night, the perceived safety of night, the relative safety of night, gliding down on your pockets of armpit, pouncing on your subterranean fungal feast and digging, 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 sniffing, sniffing, sniffing. Until you reveal the gem, the black diamond, or whatever species it is, some kind of rhizopogon, or elaphomyces, or whatever. Sheesh, not all of them smell that good, unless you're a squirrel. And you eat, and you are blessed, you are nourished, you are nurtured. And then you make your deposit, you give back, you take a dump. And then that's maybe the end of the, that part of the story. Maybe the spores have been dispersed and they will go and grow, but maybe not. Well, long comes little dung beetle pushing 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 with the hind legs pushing 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 your little ball your little spore ball put it somewhere else and eat it and put it somewhere else But if you still, if you, the squirrel, still have some of that in your belly, hasn't all passed out 
to Dung Beetle World yet? Well, then you better watch out. Because Truffle Stuffed Squirrel is about the most delicious thing in the world. If you are a spotted owl. And then swoop down from the trees. Oh shit, those talons are sharp. Ouch, that beak. Ah. And the next thing you know, you're in a pellet. Those are, those are actually regurgitated, right? The bones and hair and stuff, that's the vomit thing? Yeah. Okay, so that part goes that way. But then the spores that were in the truffles that were in the squirrel. When that owl makes the, a movement, an owl, no, a bowel movement, <laughs> spores are dispersed yet further. But that's not the end of the story, either. Because the spores are going to hopefully grow, at least some of them, and hopefully they'll make it through that whole other story we already went through. And they will not only be nourished, but they will also nourish the trees with whom they associate. Because these are all mycorrhizal fungi. They live in partnership with trees. They're mycelium, sheathing roots, working hard to gather water and minerals to give to the roots. And with gratitude, they receive sugar. Sweet, sweet sugar. From the real, the real producers, the plants. Those making sugar from sunshine. But it's not always such a graceful, rosy um, picture. Uh, who here has ever smelled, not a truffle, a stink horn? Uh, we're on the East Coast. They're like not actually rare here. <laughs> oh. Beached whale? 
That's the stinky squid stink horn. In my experience. Uh, rotting seal. Um, um, what else? Ooh, brutal. <laughs> what? Well, the stink corn is kind of like truffle. Kind of. Kind of not. The stink horn makes smells too. To attract animals for spore dispersal. But these are less of the sex pheromones, although there may be some in there too. They do sometimes smell like semen, really. And maybe sulfides, like brassica funk, a little bit of that. Definitely rotting meat, carrion. Because they want carrion flies. Beetles. Carnivorous wasps. Snails. And whoever else from the invertebrates who wants to come feast upon these earthly delights. So, like a puffball, the stink horn begins enveloped in a membrane called the peridium. Not a perennium, a peridium. And Tissues. Chewy. Maybe a little crunchy if you've ever eaten one. Oh, believe me, some people do. And these... These... All to support a head covered in sticky, stinky gleba. For you to you. And hours later, the buffet is closed. <laughs> Down crashes the tower, soft and flaccid, utterly spent, useless. But not all of them look like penises. Some actually look like anuses. Some are quite vulval. But all of them stink. Now Another, another topic I'd like to address is that of partnership, of compatibility, of attraction, of sex in the biological sense. Not the act, but more the character the composition. We in our species, how many do we have? How many? Oh, I love it. Bimodal distribution. Can you break that down for me, please? Can you break that down for us, please? Exactly. 
so the Intersex Society of North America has classified 23 distinct intersex conditions, ways of being biologically in between male and female. But can we really put a number on it? Fun I can. There are some mushrooms that have two mating types. These are rare. The most famous being the most commonly cultivated, the most commonly eaten. Are you okay? Good. In the whole world, that being Agaricus bisphorus, the button mushroom, the domesticated mushroom, the grocery store mushroom. Two sexes. Two mating types. It's exceptional. Many fungi have more than one place in their genome that determine their sexual identity, if you want to call it that. And there are often multiple factors, multiple expressions for each of these possible ways. Suddenly there are many, many ways of being. And many possibilities for being with. And this can get very interesting. Let me see who I have. I saw some on the wood pile back there by the by the fairy ring campground. Some usually ah uh, yes, there's always one in here at least. There is a famous little mushroom which many people have seen but not noticed. Schizophilum commune one of the most common mushrooms in all the world. Schizophilum means split leaf or split gill. And in English, split gill fungus is the name. If you've never met this mushroom before, time to start paying more attention to little fuzzy gray things that grow on logs. Because this mushroom is an illustrious example of a successful species. This mushroom has mastered the art of sexual diversity. This mushroom has over 23,000 mating types. Many, 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 many ways to be a split gill. And makes for a lot of potential connections. Because with so much diversity, there is a lot more difference and a lot less similarity. So the reason, one of the reasons biologically that we have different mating types is to prevent inbreeding depression, to prevent the the deterioration of the genome from not mixing with enough difference. And so, split gill, this one split gill, if it has many spores coming from it, which after a little moistening it may, 
Does anybody have water handy? Fill my pond, please. We are bathing this mushroom. This mushroom that has been in my suitcase. Ah, oh, thank you. For a few years now. Hanging out with my electronic musical instruments and my cassette tapes. Sporulating on my cassette tapes. <laughs> this mushroom. Well, each spore that comes from this mushroom, couldn't it grow into a mycelium and then mate and partner with 99.98% of the other members of its species? That's a lot of options. So it can really find who it's really compatible with, beyond just one fits in the other but really they go together. And that has created immense adaptability to where this mushroom is literally one of the most common in all the world. It grows on almost every type of wood that plants ever invented. I've seen it in every country I've ever visited. Except maybe Ireland, I was only nine years old. I didn't meet this mushroom yet then. But it was probably there. And... They have this amazing capability. When they get dried out, they close up. The split gills are like labia. Moistening, opening, drying, closing. And when moist and open, even after a long time of dormant, dry being, this mushroom, once fully hydrated, will probably release spores, viable spores, after years in my suitcase. Now, that's not the most extreme situation it can endure. There was this mycologist named Fuller. He did a lot of weird stuff with these mushrooms. If, if he was into S&M, he was definitely the S. He took these mushrooms and he carried them around in the pocket of his tweed coat. He was originally from Britain. He lived in Canada for most of his life. I don't think split gills really like to wear tweed, but they were agreeable enough. They're quite adaptable. Then he took them to the lab weeks later, and he dried them. He sealed them in vacuum tubes. He put some in liquid oxygen to get them very, very, very cold. He put some in a little chamber and exposed them to radiation. He put some in the closet and left them there for decades. And I tell you that is the last fucking place a mushroom this fucking queer wants to be. Even worse than in liquid oxygen. And then he took them out. He got them wet and they sporulated. Now, if somebody froze you in liquid oxygen, irradiated you, stuffed you in an herbarium closet for 40 years, took you out, sprinkled a little water on you, do you think you could ovulate or ejaculate? Well, thank you all for listening. Thank you to the mushrooms for speaking. I hope that I've 
translated their story in an okay way. <laughs> <laughs>